I don't know if the mic's picking that up. I'm sure everybody's seen Alka Seltzer. Well, this is something, I think it's Canadian. They call it Eno. Oh, that tastes horrible, just like I remember it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Red Mornings. Clearly on Donovan Standard Time this morning as it's 9-11. 10 minutes behind schedule. Looks like I owe you guys 10 minutes of really good content. <laughs> Make up for this slack-ass post-Valentine's Day introduction. How's everybody doing? I see you guys are in the chat picking up the slack for me. That's awesome. <laughs> yes, Brandon, though. Welcome to the chat. If you guys are listening to this one on Spotify or iTunes or one of the other platforms, one of the best quotes that's popped up in my YouTube feed recently was one we had from Carl, Black Label Logic. Brandon's talking about it in the chat. He says, think about it. Slang Poon is one night, maybe even a few months if you really know what you're doing, but World of Warcraft is forever. <laughs> Carl, never change. I see we got John Watts, Jack Napier. Also, how was Red Evening on Friday? If you guys don't know, he has a Friday evening show to this Saturday morning show. So you can get drunk with your old lady and watch Jack and Rob and Aaron Clary and the group do their thing. Then be hungover, wake up Saturday morning and nurse your hangover while you're waiting to get ready to go to the gym. Eric Wendell, Bayberg. OC, yes. Oh, OC Street Racer. Look at this. A full house today. Honestly, guys, here, I'll do some real talk for a second here. I am truly thankful, you guys. Um, when I first showed up to that convention that shall not be named, and I don't know how many people had this same mentality, but I thought, you know, these guys are giving me literally an hour of their time and attention. And in the modern world, attention is a luxury. It's like the last bottlenecked resource around. So the fact that you guys are willing to sit here for two hours and hear me Belt out definitions. Hey, what's going on, Marty? Like I said, you're giving me your time and attention, and I treat that with a little bit of reverence. Having said that, I think we've fluffed you guys enough. Let's uh, let's get our electrolytes back up to speed and get into the content. If you haven't seen it, the topic for today is boring definitions. Now, there's a lot of new people to the channel. A few of you are probably listening on this. You're going, what the hell are you talking about? Well, I thought we should deal with this stuff right here and there. Smartly, I didn't actually pull this stuff early on for the post, which I really should have done. But every couple weeks, there's some clout chaser on Twitter or social media in general that usually follows up after the feminist line where, you know, red pill guys are absolutely unattractive, blah, 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 orange man, bad stuff. Then following up on it, there's usually some guy and it's kind of one of the reasons that we've had like an ongoing feud between Travcons and red pill guys, the traditional conservative guys who like believe in the dream, but aren't living it. And they'll start doing a, well, and then they turn red pill into an ideology because that's the only thing they know how to do is fight ideologies, which it's not or they'll turn it into some kind of philosophy or scientific study going, well, Evo Sykes much more rigorous. And honestly, they're always annoying. And the worst part is most people have never heard of any of this nerd stuff. And I don't blame them because it's pretty unattractive. So for the sake of, uh, for the sake of learning and filling a good Saturday morning, I thought, why not talk about some definitions so people can learn what we're talking about. Listen to the tool lads. They are tools. Aw, don't be soy. 55, hi, Guy. Hey, Ryan, first time watching live. <laughs> it's good to see you, man. You're going to enjoy yourself, I guarantee. Especially when we got inside jokes like Mr. Borgen's here. <laughs> Speaking of the exact kind of situation we were talking about. Oh, you have to forgive me. I got a bit of an allergy thing last night, so my nose might be running. I might be sniffling. If I have to walk away from the desk, it's because I got to go blow my nose quickly, and I don't want to do it on camera. I bought my wife an apron for Valentine's Day. Oh, Marty. That's the Skittles, man. Um, Here we go. I had to pull up my own damn tweet. 
if you're not list, if you're listening to this and not watching it, what I've got open right now is a tweet about former Red Pill content creators talking about how Red Pill is this or that or the other thing. And I had a couple questions. I'll deal with these ones because I figure why not? The first one is how many levels are in the bitch management guide and what's its purpose? If you guys don't know, this is a reference to something called the human sock puppet. That's his pen names, bitch management guide. Now the purpose of it is for guys to tailor their investment into girls that are worth their investment. A lot of guys completely jump the shark. They start dating a girl two weeks in. They're calling her their girlfriend. They're treating it like a monogamous marriage. And then they get their heart broken. And then they wonder, why are women so bad? Well, in this case, it's not the women or anything. It's that the guy overinvested. And typical to us guys, we're like, how can we make this sound abrasive enough that no Karen comes in and tries to uh, soften the language? Because that's kind of the issue. Athel K had it with what's called the Married Man Sex Life Primer Forums. It was essentially married guys going in, swapping notes, kind of what we did with uh, the married side of the red pill. Problem was, he started letting his wife run the thing, who started bringing other girls in there, and it slowly devolved into like a bunch of girls basically just dictating how guys act and think. Completely killed the place, compelled any utility, lost a bunch of money. So when we make these things abrasive, it's kind of on purpose. But to answer the question, four levels. There's zero, which is like a one night stand, all the way up to one, two, and three. And three is basically a long-term relationship or uh, a good wife. You can always go up in the promotions, but you can never, or but once you go down, you can never go back. Bam, question one. What does verbal intercourse as optional means? Question two. Here's a good one too. This is, I always want to say it's Scorch Zang, but it might be uh, Sorcerer King. Anyways, one of the moderators who's been around longer than me in the Married Red Pill, he came out with this concept. And it's for a lot of guys whose girls want to talk to him and they don't want to talk for whatever reason. Maybe she doesn't, she's picking a fight and he doesn't want any part of it, whatever. She follows him around the house, constantly wanting a conversation. And so verbal intercourse is optional is our version and it's the greatest thing because he had like a reference of uh, a guy who wanted sex from his wife, but she's not in the mood. So he chases her around the house naked with like a raging erection. That's the equivalent of a girl following you around the house for your time and attention. And so when they say verbal intercourse is optional, it's for a guy to understand part of your value in a relationship is that you offer time, affection, attention, commitment. And you're valuable enough that the girl values it. So you got to start treating that as optional. It's not mandatory. You don't have to engage. You don't have to fight just because somebody else wants to fight. It's a very good strategy that they use to help build frame. Three, what is threat point? Threat point is something that uh, is based primarily on the work by Dalrock, a Christian red-pilled guy who's trying to navigate sexual marketplace, understand the terrain, Raise a happy family, wife and two daughters, I think it was. And also Kaoni Galt, the first red pilled reference in social media anywhere. So they talk about the emasculation paradox where guys are so worried about the threat point of divorce that they act more submissive because they're hoping that if they act nice, that she won't use that weapon against them. The paradox is that by guys acting that soft and submissive way and always good to hopefully not get divorced, it encourages the girl to want to leave them more because she smells blood in the water. So threat point is based on that concept. And then uh, a study that came out, and I wish I could remember the author's name. It's on my private forums. If you guys are on the Patreon and you've got access to the forums right now, it's in there under threat point. But the idea they found was is that this no-fault divorce and uh, cash and prizes thing has actually put a cooling effect on marriages in general. And a lot of guys tend to change their behavior because they're worried about becoming, you know, a part of the machine. So it's kind of neat. We'll go to number four. What is the anti-dump machine? This one, and it's a bit of a trick question because it's not red pill per se. It's more pickup from the So Suave days from a guy named Anti-Dump. It was prior to the book of Pook. And if you guys have read that, it's a pretty good book. It's a great one on mindset and attractiveness. The anti-dump machine was a system that this guy anti-dump used in order to gauge uh, 
emotional investment from girls. This is the simple way to put it. Um, for naming one Roycey Maxim, here's the thing. I can't remember off the top of my head, and I'm always going to get them mixed up. But he peppered throughout his... Uh, it's like, anybody watch Deep Space Nine? You remember those Ferengi rules of acquisition? But you know what? Hold this thought. I'm going to go quickly blow my nose off camera. Damn you on this dead air on line, you stupid... Ah. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, yeah. The Royce's Maxims. So he uh, peppered in a bunch of his Maxims when he was doing a post, essentially just using a rule of thumb applied to one of his field reports, which is pretty cool. <laughs> I like you guys swapping notes about your uh, Christmas or Valentine's Day stuff, by the way. Very funny. And there's a little definition that goes into that one, too. Uh I remember, was it 48? Let's see if I can pull up Roycey Chateau Artiste Maxim, number 48. This was the good stuff. This was before he kind of went, he gave up his site when he got doxxed when he was working in DC. Oh, there we go. Somebody actually does have a collection of them. But yeah, they're not really numbered in order. It's like it's a said, it's a, it's a literary use. But uh, Maxim 8 is one of my favorites. Always assume she's a slut. It helps kicks the legs out from under the pedestal that you'll be tempted to put her on. And more often than not, it's true. It's very clever stuff. Um, one rule of Iron to Massey. Everybody should know rule seven. It's better to source a new girl than it is to root through garbage with the old one. What did the Misandry bubble get wrong? The Misandry bubble is a neat little book. Um, it's kind of more MGTOW, I guess. It's hard to explain. But anyways... They talk about it as if the gender dynamic has reached its peak and things are going to start swinging on the pendulum to a more masculine way. The one main thing it got wrong is it assumed that the market would become rational much sooner than it did. I think it's Warren Buffett that said the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. And we are experiencing that. Uh, yes, Marty, Dalrock was the threat point writer, but between the two of them, that like these things, this is the best part about the, the blogosphere early on is that writers would feed off of each other. And then one guy would come up with a note and an idea and wrap a theory around a field report. And then other people were building on it. So the, the main thing was Dalrock. Yes. But uh, back to this though. So that's one of the things the misandry bubble got wrong. Who started the red pill and who started married red pill. Those are the subreddits, which are kind of more free form note swapping. The red pill was started by a user PK Atheist, which has since been doxxed to be Robert Fisher, a uh, politician out of New England, I believe it was. He created it because he didn't like the MRA side of things where everybody would just whine about, you know, feminism being the big bad boogeyman. And he goes, well, we can't really talk about anything because then you just frame it all wrong. Same time he uh, saw the seduction or the pickup community always saying, you know, just pick better, bro. And they pedestalized women to an extent that wasn't really helpful. So he decided to create this place, which took more of uh, the three R's. In that case was Roosh at the time, Roycey and Rolo, and come up with better ideas on how to navigate this marketplace, which is definitely cool. Now, MRP, the Married Red Pill, which is a separate a separate place, different demographics, was created by a guy whose username is Isolos. Not many people know much about him, but... He's kind of more been hands off. He's been the watchmaker Jesus of married red pill. He thought uh, in the red pill for a lot of guys who first started swapping notes, the answer to most girls that you're casually dating that act wrong is just to leave them hard next. That's what they refer to. And he goes, well, if you own a house, have a wife and three kids next probably shouldn't be the first thing on your mind. Every imagined slight. So he built up a concept there where, what do you do before the next? That's essentially what the Married Red Pill is all about. So that's pretty cool. Uh, on nine here, what is the Red Pill assessment of feminism? Now, it's not a monolith because there's obviously different opinions. But in general, most people have considered feminism to be a societal-wide shit test or fitness test that guys have roundly failed or that it's a tactic, not an ideology. 
That's why when you talk to a feminist, there's sex positive and sex negative feminists. There's uh, everything, everything that you have that makes a feminist has no true feminist talking the exact opposite thing because it's not a coherent worldview. It's not an ideology. It's just literally girls have learned that you can nag and appeal to guys better sense of nature. Like, hey, be fair, be honest, be nice, help me out. Guys will end up giving free stuff. And so they learn that. Uh, why is red pill amoral? I think I should. So we have, and no offense to you guys. Some of you guys are great, but some of you guys are kind of lukewarm with the IQ there or the, the definitions. That's fine. Everybody has their own traits in that. Amoral and immoral are different things. Immoral means people who act against morality. Killing is wrong. I kill people because it's fun. That's immoral. Amoral is where you just don't judge it. So that's B, if you're running a policy on how do we get less murders out there, you don't think about your sensibilities. You're just like, okay, how do I solve this problem dispassionately? And that's amorality. That's been useful. And again, based off of the Athol K stuff I was talking about before, where they kind of got nuked because a bunch of girls went in there, started moralizing and completely neutered the purpose of the place. The reason it's amoral is because as soon as guys start talking about what you should be doing and what makes a real man and all those categorical imperatives, there's a little Hume reference for you there. People stop focusing on what's best for you and they stop focusing on what you can do and strategy and they'd end up focusing on uh, idealization. What would Jesus do doesn't really matter because what do you want to do and what do you, outcome do you want to achieve? So you got to keep it amoral. You got to have some people say things that you're going to find morally repugnant in a neutral way because otherwise you just can't get any work done. Number 11, what's the praxeological strategy? I should have said framework for a family. This one credit goes out to Ian Ironwood, one of the old married guys that first kind of started this thing back in the 2010s-ish. And from a terrain standpoint, most families are two income earners. Wives, husbands, everybody works. The idea of wanting a wife barefoot and pregnant at home, it's a thing of the past. It's probably not going to happen. Having said that, you've seen the stats. Girls are going to college more. Girls are starting to earn more. I think uh, if you do it across the board, if you have a uh, a woman who hasn't taken time off or uh, having kids yet, 108% income based on a guy's income. So eight cents on the dollar extra. Which means there's going to be a lot more women that are earning more money than their husbands. And that's just going to be increasing over time. So understanding that and then historically finding out that a male dominated household has tended to have been the family unit that's had the best longevity over human history. Take those two things together and you're like, okay, so what do we do with that? Well, you got to disregard economic input as the means of establishing dominance. And this is where I talk about uh, stop being a commodity good, be a luxury item. Like you being the best option for a girl, like sexually, emotionally, every other way but economically is the way you stave off that worry of having your girl earning more than you. And that's a realistic thing. And it's going to be coming up. I think it's 40% already in the states of marriages. The wife is the primary breadwinner. So that's what that's about. Anyways, we'll end this one off and go back to uh, goofing around here. Hey, everybody. <laughs> a quick little break. I love how you guys. <laughs> um, rule number one, frame is everything. After yesterday, I'm weeding my plates and the thirst on Tinder is real right now. Oh, I'll bet. I've heard a lot of people have like specific game they do just on lonely person game for uh, Valentine's Day. <laughs> Damn, we're up to 111 of us. Um, do I suggest you guys smash the like button? You kind of already know to do that. I have no idea how that emphasizes or de-emphasizes the uh, algorithm or not, but I know everybody's supposed to say smash the like button, so just smash it. Oh. I don't know why I'm getting allergies. It must be that... Uh... Actually, you know what? I think we're going to be done with that. Um definitions definitions are important why are definitions important shut up they just are uh if we aren't talking on the same page actually you know what i should be doing it's something i've always liked um 
all right, I'm going to tell you a story now because screw it. We got time to kill. Um, when I was working through the military, there was a lot of times where I'm on midnight shifts. And one of the things that always happened is that CBC Radio 1 was playing on the back. If you guys don't know, that's our uh, National Broadcasting Corporation has like a radio podcast format they do at night. You guys may remember the most famous guy on it, Jan Giomeshi, the guy who uh, got his little Me Too accusation because of uh, what's her face from the Trailer Park Boys saying that he choked her. Then you look into it and find out she was into it and totally liked it, but just did this for clout. Kind of ruined the Trailer Park Boys and Jan's career there. Definitely not a Cosby scenario, but I kind of got a little bit of nostalgia for that. And I've got, I know you guys have seen it. You know that evening radio ASMR where you talk right into the microphone and you have like a very comfortable then the great author of blah, blah. I love that stuff. I think one of these days I have the coronavirus. You guys are jerks. <laughs> oh, Jesus. No, no coronavirus for me. Some lazy elbows, though, knocking things around. Moving the light filter. Got to keep the background in cyan. Yeah, the coronavirus. That's just things crazy, is it not? There's Spurgs in the comments. Damn it. <laughs> the Spurgs are a metric for success. That's uh, BJ Tucker 5. He says, as I'm getting popular, the Spurgs should start popping out more. Oh, I hope. I hope so, and I hope not. <laughs> Yeah, coronavirus. That's some that's some scary stuff. Not so much because the virus itself. I'm still of the I don't expect it to be worse than SARS. It's just that people have been so lackluster about hygiene and uh disease that this thing is getting a chance to run rampant because people were so worried about looking racist, but whatever. And as for JD, the trailer park boys were a Canadian treasure. You're absolutely right. Anyways, a part of me always, I know it's like the most boomer take ever, but I always like those uh, ASMR, CBC Radio 1 evening podcast stuff. I'd love to kind of do that format, but it's absolutely horrible. But hey, this is what you end up doing in these things. Um, definitions. Let's get back to work here. Can't be screwing around. There's a whole bunch of definitions. And luckily enough... Let me pull it up here. There we go. Spurk de spurk spurk. Bam. Bam. The updated glossary of terms and acronyms. Now, this is by no means a exhaustive list, but I think it's nice if you kind of in this space, if you're interested in sexual dynamics, if you want to see what all the hullabaloo is about, why are red pillars so weird and Nazi-ish, here you go. Although I kind of take some disagreement with some of these terms, so they really do need to be updated. The big one, alpha. I This is probably the most misunderstand understood term in this space. In this case, they're using it as a demographic. They call it socially dominant, somebody who displays high value or traits that are sexually attractive to women. Alpha can refer to a man who exhibits the behaviors, but usually to describe the individual behaviors themselves. I don't like the idea of people saying that alpha is a demographic or an identity. It just does not work. It doesn't hold up to scrutiny. It confuses things. And it just gives people who want to attack you like that cringe factor that allowed them to do it. Somebody displaying high value and traits sexually attractive women is the key point to that. So alpha, stop thinking of like, is he alpha? If you're ever asking yourself, is this man an alpha male? Just know you're making up gobbledygook. And this is coming from a space where guys made up gobbledygook. But our gobbledygook works. So screw it. Displays of higher value and traits that are sexually attractive to women. Not sec uh, not sexually attractive in like I would make him my husband. Sexually attractive as in I'm going to do him in the bar bathroom. Keep that in mind. It's always does it make a girl wet. Alpha Widow. That's an old school one. Yeah, I'll, you can read in here. It says a woman typically, but not necessarily past the wall who's been abandoned by an alpha male. Again, see, this is where you run into problems. Once you treat it as a demographic, then you make this like weird specific use case that doesn't really map to society very well or doesn't really map to reality very well. But this is just a hypergamy thing. An alpha widow is somebody who's 
unable to get commitment from her sexual best option or hypergamous best option. And so she moves on to the second best thing. The problem is she still has that instinct that the one that got away and she never quite gives her all of the one she's with. If you want to read more on that, Rolo Tomasi has a great article on his website called Saving the Best. And right there is exactly the ab example of what an alpha widow would be. Amog is the next one. That's the alpha male of the group. And that's that's an old pickup definition, actually. It's the equivalent of a guy who's using bravado to kind of like socially jockey for position with you in front of other people. And they just call it amogging. So if you've ever been out on a date with a girl and then some dude walks up, it's like, oh, is this your little brother? That's you getting amogged. It's good to know because a lot of guys love to kind of fight for position like chicks do. So just be aware of when it's happening. Uh, AFBB is the alpha fucks beta bucks. If you don't know, that is the manifestation of hypergamy, I guess, where girls for looking for their sexual uh, best interests, looking out for their sexual best interests, they try to find the AFBB, or if you think of it as lover and provider, the man that makes me hot, those alpha behaviors we talked about before, and then the beta ones, traits of provision, stuff that makes me comfortable. Uh, AWALT. <laughs> I, I'm going to come back to AWALT in a sec. I'll do beta first because AWALT is one of those ones that's really loaded and it does do well to get some clarification. I'm going to switch over to Boomer Juice, by the way. Gives you wings. In the same way that Alpha is sexually attractive and desirable displays of higher value, Beta is the comfortable ones. A man who has a good job, a man who's good with kids, a man who cuddles on the weekends. These are all beta behaviors. Girls have anxiety. They tend to be neurotic. Apparently somebody's trying to break into the house. Uh, girls tend to be more neurotic to a guy's an order of magnitude more. And so uh, getting comfortable and staving off that anxiety is kind of a big part of their mental firmware. So be aware that these beta behaviors are done for that purpose. Now, you can't have a relationship if there's no beta behavior. So it's not, you can't just be alpha 100% of the time, all the time, and expect things to work out. That ends for very short-term, non-monogamous situations. But if you want to have any longevity with the girl you're with, you need to pepper in enough of those, you know, beta comfortable behaviors in order to, you know, keep her comfortable enough that she's willing to stick around with you for whatever length of time. So AWALT, all women are like that. This is probably one of the most controversial ones because every woman takes it to mean you're a bad person. <laughs> uh, most of the time when you see people argue about this stuff, especially online, the girl is just arguing that she's not a bad person. She's fighting for her reputation. Meanwhile, the guy's fighting over definitions. So the arguments go nowhere. When you think of all women are like that or AWALT, think of gun safety treat all guns as if they're loaded and you have a gun arguing with you well i'm not loaded i've never been loaded i would never be loaded all right fine but that's not the point of this it's not a description of the real world and it's also why i will tell you guys it's never been about truth but utility it is very useful to assume all the i don't want to say just worse because it's not about only the bad things but for the sake of argument just stick with it Always assume the worst about a girl. Let her prove you wrong. That's the point of it. It's a heuristic to allow guys to kind of like look at what's in front of them. Don't assume the best. Don't have that women is wonderful or halo effect in your life because that's how you get burned. So, Oh, this is kind of a cringy one too. Blue pill from the Matrix and its sequels. The path of conformity with society's expectations. The state being unaware of the problems. The danger to society, blah, blah, blah. Essentially, anything that's not red pill is blue pill. Anything that doesn't work, anything that's built just on uh, your feelings, it's blue pill. Doesn't really matter. It's not so much a coherent thing. It's just to talk about red pill stuff. Anything outside of that will be blue pill. <laughs> the cock carousel. That one's funny. Um, that just means... A girl that's in her sexual prime, enjoying her sexual prime. They call it a carousel because then the idea is she wants to get off when... <coughs> Excuse me. She wants to get off when it's no longer possible. Or 
some argue too. Here's the thing. Some people argue that girls like to waste their 20s and then at the tail end of their 20s want to settle down and have a good man. Other people argue that girls will would waste their 20s in perpetuity if they stayed like if you look the same as you did at 19 that they would assume girls would act like that for the rest of their lives but because they're no longer able to that's when they automatically switch their mental firmware to like maybe i want to settle down i don't really care which is true just as a concept that's what it's about yeah some of these ones aren't too important like sure to chateau hertiste excuse me How unprofessional. Jesus. Chateau Ortiz. He's one of the original three R's of the Manosphere. That was Roycey. Uh, old stuff is good. New stuff kind of got a bit white nationalist. Not really my cup of tea, but whatever you do, you. Closing. That's essentially, yeah, the apex of an interaction. So if you're trying to sleep with a girl, the close is when you sleep with her. If you're trying to get a phone number, they call it a number close. It's, closing is just, yeah, it's, it's closing. It's not really too big of a deal, but just to be aware. Comfort tests. These are, so when you think of, when I talk about alpha being desire and beta being comfort, there's uh, fitness tests and comfort tests. Comfort test is the beta side of things. A girl is worried about her place in your relationship and she throws out a comfort test. Usually it tends to be very central, like very eye focused. If you hear a girl saying, I, 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 like, I don't know what I can do. I can't deal with this, blah, blah, blah. She's usually searching for some sort of comfort. And when I joke around, make references about take a girl's finger painting, put it on the fridge. That's the kind of stuff I talk about. You can pass them if you want to, but just realize it's a girl looking for comfort and beta behaviors to assuage her anxiety. Most guys don't get this because this is the kind of thing when a girl can't lock a guy down, this is what she comes up with or a girl that's worried about getting cheated on. They tend to throw out these comfort tests. The opposite side is fitness tests, where a girl gets the vibe that you're displaying higher value alpha characteristics. She's got that sexual desire, but women have this innate distrust for men, and I don't blame them. A lot of us are pretty trash. So what they do is they throw out a test to basically gauge whether it's a false signal or not. Is he really turning me on, or is it just my mind playing tricks on me kind of stuff? Covert contracts. This one is important if you understand, like a lot of the stuff's kind of jokey and cringy, but if you understand nothing else here, you will take the greatest benefit in your relationship life if you understand what a covert contract is. A covert contract is a term coined by Dr. Uh, Glover. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Great books. Kind of like the... Uh, quintessential book of the this space anyways it's an unspoken deal with terms the other party would never agree to most typically seen by orbiters trying to negotiate desire if i do a favor for her she'll go out for me i wish i should probably i could probably spend an entire episode two hours just talking about covert contracts because the amount of covert contracts guys have in their life is mind-blowingly nuts Anytime you do something with expectations of the other person reciprocating, it's an unattractive display and girls automatically nuke those things from orbit because they don't like the responsibility of having to live up to their end of it, which makes sense. If somebody made you made a deal with you and didn't ask you first, you'd probably do the same thing. The next is dark triad, and that is a combination of three specific personality traits, or I guess behavioral traits may be more accurate. Uh, narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy. Now, as far as short-term strategies go, there's been a multiple series of studies out there that have shown these tend to be selected for by women as more attractive or alpha behaviors. I talk a lot about narcissism myself. Machiavellianism, if you've ever talked about, everybody has a lot of conversations about the laws of power. That's where those are coming from. Psychopathy, uh, David Dutton's Wisdom of Psychopaths talks about that one a lot. It's just one of those things and, you know, science has never really been very good at it, but they've just noticed that there's a correlation between these traits and female sexual interest. If you don't believe me, just go to any serial killer documentary and find out how many love letters they're getting from chicks and how many girls try to sneak over there and hook up with them. It's just one of those things. Uh, DHVs and DLVs, displays of higher and lower value. 
kind of speak for themselves. Oh, wow. They're using some like hardcore pickup terms here. So there's DQ, which is disqualification. And this is used by women as an IOD, which is an, oh, well, this is so nerdy, indicator of disinterest. Um, what you do want to do on a disqualification is you give the girl a reason why she probably wouldn't want to date you seriously. But it's something that, uh, it's a push-pull dynamic. So by saying, yeah, yeah, you don't want this. No, well, maybe I do. What is it? No, 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 no. You don't want this. It's not for you. Well, I kind of do now. It's that reverse psychology thing. It's kind of neat. And if you can do it as a method of truth, like sometimes you're just, you just know you're not a fit for a girl. Maybe she's a really sweet girl. She wants to settle down, have five kids with like her Mormon husband and whatever, but she's showing some interest in you. You're like, look, I'm a dirty heathen. You don't want any part of this. I'm not going to be good for you. And a lot of times that ends up piquing female interest. So it's just one of those things. Reason why it makes sense too, because most guys are so thirsty that they will latch onto a girl at any opportunity for anything. And so a guy who actually is like telling her no before even starting really piques somebody's interest. Uh, dread game. This one here, it's a horrible definition. They really got it wrong, but that's because the TRP is mostly single guys. But yeah, I'm not like it, the definition they use here is purposely inciting jealousy in an LTR by openly getting attention from other women. Soft dread is similar, but less open. I'm just going to skip past that because that's not it. That's not it at all. That's a female centric way of looking at it. And that's a covert contract in and of itself. The way to look at dread is it's a systematic series of steps to detach yourself from a sexually unfulfilling relationship and to put yourself into another one as soon as possible while leaving an olive branch out. If the other person decides to start acting right, that you can revisit the relationship later on. By the time you're enacting it, the relationship's already over. You're just taking the understanding that, uh, oh, excuse me again. <laughs> My God, man. Um, by the time you get to dread, the relationship is over. This is those guys who like, I'm married. And my wife hasn't slept with me in six months. She's saying like, uh, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. Or maybe she's got a side piece and she's not sleeping with you, but she sleep with him. Whatever. Sexually unfulfilled specifically. So you want to probably ditch her. Your dignity's there. It's like, I got to leave her. I don't deserve this. I deserve better. That's fine. Problem is, if you just walk out the door and try up another relationship or sleep with a girl right away, you're going to screw that up because you have so much baggage built up. You're so unattractive that you basically turn this girl against you and you're just going to make the same mistake with the next one. So that's when you get into dread with steps. There's 12 steps total. It's kind of like an Alcoholics Anonymous program, but a couple of them are kind of interchangeable. Start with making yourself more attractive, removing your unattractive traits, and once you've got all that in place, you're essentially in shape, have frame, can do comfort tests and fitness tests, uh, dress well, you've understood and learned game, and then you practice it on the wife. The wife doesn't respond to it. You start practicing on other people. And then it's at that point where you start making those hard decisions. Uh, like I said, this is a whole thing that could cover its own topic, so I'll skip past it. Yeah, feminism, whatever. I don't really talk about it. I don't like it. It's just... Ooh, actually, they kind of had a decent enough description of it. Maybe I will go into it. <laughs> Guys, I don't have the coronavirus. It's just a little bit of allergies. You're killing me. Feminism is a doctrine built on the presupposition of victimhood by women as by men as a foundation of female identity. That's actually kind of funny. That's pretty well put, actually. Uh, I'm going to take a break from that for a bit. Got to get these out. Yeah, I'm trying to get them. Um, I just spoke with my allergist. And uh, so they're putting me on a new type of medication for this spring. And if that doesn't work out, then we're going to start doing those allergy shots. I've heard those things are just amazing. You guys are killing me. I finally get a chance to skip through the chats here. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. Um, by the way, quick little update. So if you guys don't know, we're going to be talking about it on Rule Zero after this. It's on Rich's channel. We're going to be having our own little get-up, a meet-together, a little workshop. 
Rule Zero Live. It's going to be kind of cool. Like we'll talk about the details there, but uh, if you guys haven't, we're only talking with the private community guys on this one. So like if you're part of the Patreon, the private community, you kind of already know what's going on here, but we'll start the, we'll start up the uh, registration this weekend and you guys are going to have a blast. I think it'll be pretty fun, but uh, details are all going to be in there. If you haven't joined it yet on my Patreon, where we're going to talk about that more. <laughs> Look at you guys with your chicken little stuff. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, by the way, if I had coronavirus, they'd be throwing me into a weird box and, <laughs> and I'd be shipped off to a hospital never to be seen again. So we can say just by that I'm sitting here, we're fine. <laughs> It has been a good time. Hope everybody enjoyed their Valentine's Day. Um, definitions. I guess we're kind of ripping through those. Let's get back into that. I don't know. I'm having some fun with this. Because a lot of this stuff I don't deal with very much. So it's kind of neat to see it again and again and again. Helps you reinforce it. And some things I've forgotten about. Um, frame. The context in which something is perceived. Maintaining frame is often cited as the most important aspect to alpha behavior. See iron rule of Tomasi number one. It's kind of good, but frame is one of those concepts is difficult to get a concise definition of because yeah, frame. Frame came from, I think mystery was the one who first talked about it where he was saying it's like defining reality for an interaction, but from a socio or from like a conversational uh, aspect, frame is kind of who sets the narrative. If you're watching mainstream media and they set a certain tone of like a way to interpret the Trump impeachment or whatever you're talking about, that's kind of an example of frame. Frame is you not getting rattled unless you want to. It's essentially you reacting to the things outside of you that you want to and not reacting to things you don't want to. In a way, it's a healthy level of narcissism. But yeah, the context in which something is perceived is a pretty good way of describing it. Friend zone, if you don't know what that is, I don't know why you're following me. Game, a loosely based set of behaviors specifically designed to increase attraction. It's perfectly normal. Gaslighting, it's not really a red-pilled one. Uh, they refer to it as a form of mental abuse in which false information is presented with the intention of making victims doubt their own memory, perception, and sanity. As much as girls love to rag about how guys are gaslighting them, girls gaslight guys a lot. It's just one of those things. So it's something to be aware of. Uh, when we talk about the hamster, that's another good one. It's used to describe the way women rationalize things as a way to resolve con mental conflicts and avoid cognitive dissonance. Essentially, if a girl's lying to herself, it's she's the hamster wheels running. The HB scale, and that's just a 1 to 10 scale for chicks. Like, whatever. That's been around since forever. We like systemizing things. Personally... I think there's only three. There's only fours, fives, and sixes. Fours are girls you would sleep with, but hide from your friends. Fives are ones you'd sleep with, but you wouldn't brag about. And sixes are ones you'd sleep with and you'd brag about. Other than that, it's just whatever. I like keeping it simple like that. Hypergamy. And this one is, I should really wait for Rolo to talk about this one because uh, <laughs> it's kind of his thing. But it's, it's originally coined from, I think it was a socioeconomic paper, came out of like the 1900s, Victorian era-ish, um, or 1800s, sorry, about Indian caste society. We've kind of adopted the term, and it's just, it's just the instinctual urge for women to find the best uh, sexually desirable man possible, and then try and lock him down. They're going to go through a whole lot of descriptions here, which is kind of cringy, but that's just it. Women, I think it was Oscar Wilde who said this, men are creatures that love infinite variety. Women are simple. They'll settle for the best. And I was like, it's pretty much a good way to describe it. Um, the I word, I'm pretty sure if I mention that, YouTube will nuke this channel from orbit. So involuntarily celibate. That's the guys who want but can't. Uh, a lot of this stuff, again, is still like pickup terms, not so much things that get misinterpreted much. So I'm going to skip a lot of these ones. I mean, if you don't know what a Kino escalation, let's just be friends, last minute resistance. These are all like pickup terms, like whatever. 
monk mode. Dude, I... You guys are going to have to let me know your thoughts. I've talked with people on monk mode. I know a limitable man. If you guys don't know that, that's a guy that's uh, red-pilled. He's been around longer than me. He and Tate have their issue with his uh, online girlfriend thing. I don't really know. I don't follow it too much. He doesn't talk to me anymore. But monk mode is essentially shutting yourself off from the world and getting things done without distraction. I don't buy it because I find we're a social species. So most of the things you do are going to require an element of sociability to it too. So <laughs> Ooh, I'm going to go back to the chat here on this one. <laughs> James, if a girl's not gaslighting you, check her pulse. She might be dead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, BJ Tucker has a good point. On Valentine's Day, his wife could not believe all the guys simping while shopping yesterday, seeing all the guys with flowers and candles. And that's the funny thing. So there's nothing nothing wrong with buying flowers, but when they're attached to those covert contracts, it's simping like hell. I've kind of really disliked buying flowers for Valentine's Day, mostly because that day they just jack up the price to capitalize on that thirst, as well as I did it once. So here's the thing. When it comes to gifts for girls, it's something I've learned early on. Girls don't want flowers. Girls don't want a ring. Girls don't want gifts. What girls want is something that they can beat across the head of the friends that they're with. A girl, if you buy a girl a ring and you think she wants a ring, buy her a small one. See what she does. Or buy her one that's bigger than her friend's ring. And see what she does. And that'll let you know exactly what the whole dynamic is here. Same with flowers. So the last time I bought my girl flowers, it was uh, a delivery service. And I had it sent to her work, plopped up on her desk. Whole time I never mentioned it was happening, anything like that. She didn't like the flowers so much. She just liked that a bunch of co-workers were there complaining about their boyfriends. Meanwhile, she comes, sits at her desk. There's a big thing of flowers there with like a nice card. She just wants to flex. <laughs> So sometimes I don't mind doing that. Whatever. Girls like to have their little uh, knitting circle. So let her win these ones. But at the same time, it's like I'm not going to be obliged to do it because of this, that, or the other thing. But that's just frame. But that's me. Best flower situation I ever did, too, was what totally for my own entertainment. I love this story. I tell it all the time. Uh, my girl first moved in with me. We were living in British Columbia. And... I went, got some groceries, and I saw there was like flowers for sale there. I'm like, ah, whatever, I'll pick some up. And I left them in the trunk. I come in the house. I have all the groceries there, and I just start laying into my girl. I'm like, I work damn hard. I brought all these groceries in. You're sitting on the couch doing nothing. And I just start yelling like an angry 1970s all in the family. <laughs> I might have been wearing, might as well have been wearing a white beater. But uh, so she gets really mad. She starts getting offended. I'm like, get out there and bring in the damn groceries. And so she goes out there. She's mad and she's angry at me. And this guy's a dick. You can't talk to me like that. So she goes out there. And then the only thing out there is the trunk is open and there's a thing of flowers in the back. She came in just crying. Absolutely hilarious. <laughs> but yeah, Bayberg's got it right. They won't, they don't want flowers. They want them delivered to their office. Two times larger than the other female friends. In the same way that guys like flexing on each other in the competitive sense, we like being the best guy at the baseball team. We like being the star athlete. We like being that, you know, pinnacle ideal. Girls do their own flexes. And if you really want to start taking these romantic gestures to the next level, and by next level, I mean a competent level, realize these are flexes, female flexes against their female friends or frenemies. And play into it if you want to. You know, if she's been acting well, why wouldn't you? But... I'm buying flowers because it's February 14th. It's not, it's not it, man. And that's why men are acting and raised like defective women now, because a guy is buying a girl flowers, flexing on his other guys. That's where the simping problem comes from. Dudes, I just bought 12 roses for my girl and they're going to call him a simp because we don't care. We're not flexing. This isn't our social status. That's a girl's social status. A guy's social status is walking over on steak and a blowjob day showing the size of the steak. You know what I mean? Yeah, Jim has a good point on it too. That's the thing. If you're doing this stuff, do it because you want to. Don't do it because it's a formality or an obligation. 
if you really want to be good about it, buy it the day before or the day after. But then again, if you're just buying it because you think she'll like it, you're buying it on the day before or the day after, you're pretty much going to see exactly where the dynamic is. And that's that's the point of gifts in general, is to understand the social dynamic behind them. And I don't think enough guys do that when they really should. They really should. A lot of this stuff is absolutely fascinating once you understand the underlying dynamic to it. Gift giving, flowers, all of it. So much fun. Uh, sex is even one of those ones. It's a. I would strongly recommend you guys, if you have like a month to kill and love books that are kind of a boring slog, <laughs> Dr. David Buss and Cindy Minson have a book called Why Women Have Sex. Actually, let's pull that one up. Cindy Minston. I always get her name wrong. I can never remember if there's a, a T in it or not. They do have it. Here we go. Why Women Have Sex. Understanding Sexual Motivations from Adventure to Revenge and Everything in Between. Ah, Cindy Meston and David Buss. When it comes to understanding a lot of guys' bullshit they think about, this will solve all of it. Because when it comes to sex, women have it for so many more reasons than guys do. Guys generally have it because we're horny. That's pretty much it. We're horny or sometimes we just want to, like, you know, dominate something. Girls have sex for 817 different reasons of which the second to last one is just pure sexual desire. It's just one of those things. But uh, revenge is a good reason. A lot of girls who get cheated on by their boyfriends will take a revenge cheat, sleep with his best friend. Uh, some girls didn't even there went so far as to say they slept with a guy just for a hot meal. Three hots and a cot. <laughs> I even have a friend who his now wife admitted she only stayed, at his, stayed over at his place the first night because she was cold and she didn't want to catch a cab home. So it's just one of those things. And when you see a lot of guys talking about this romantic women like this, women like that, the reality, it's a lot less, it's a lot less entertaining. And if you go through that book and you start seeing some of the reasons girls have sex, thinking that a great romantic gesture is to buy flowers kind of loses its luster, especially when just making her cry could be way better. Trust me on this one. Ask me how I know. <laughs> Uh, cheers, Adrian. He says, thank you for the, the, the recom. Uh. <laughs> Taj said with the simps were block underground train in London was hard to get back home yesterday. Oh, did they have another, uh, protest in the London trains? Funniest thing I ever saw. If you guys haven't seen that, they had a bunch of social justice warriors protesting something in the trains, but, uh, I guess a bunch of the guys were stepping and standing on the train so they couldn't take off, but the guys wanted to work. So somebody just grabbed his ankle and threw him off so they could get in and go. <laughs> it was such like a British thing to do. It made me laugh. <laughs> Look at that. I am the flowers pitch from Confucius. Divining Rod, you're absolutely hilarious. Uh, take a quick second here. Shout out if you're listening to this one on Spotify, Apple, iTunes, Google Play, or one of the many podcast services that are out there. Feel free, subscribe. Uh, you're better off catching these things live on YouTube because they have a bit of a delay to the time that you're listening to it. But I know some of you guys listen to this stuff while you're at the gym working out. So whatever, put it on audio, get your day done, do what you got to do. I don't even mind. Yeah, the flower sticks play into females narcissism and that's i don't even know how to dude did you just fall asleep on your keyboard is that how you did your username yeah well that's the thing with gifts gifts are a double-edged sword there's a reason for gifts there's strategically a reason you would want to do gifts but at the same time girls like free stuff and if you're going to give them something they're going to take it so you got to be careful i would err on the side of not when it comes to gift giving because it really has to come from a place of abundance. 
And there is a display of higher value that comes with a guy who's very free flowing with this stuff. Like any rappers out of the bar, what are they doing? They're having bottle service and they're inviting all the girls to come and enjoy free booze. So there is a strategic reason you want to be generous, but at the same time, not be taken advantage of. So when you think of your gift giving, if you could frame it within a red pill perspective, and that's where I talk about understanding the idea of a social flex from a girl's standpoint, simping from a guy's standpoint, frame from a guy's standpoint, the purpose for gifts from a girl's standpoint. Like once you understand all the pieces and all the different reasons and motivations, you start to become much more socially savvy with strategic gift giving, I guess. You're giving it because you want to. You're doing it from a place of abundance. You're giving the gift in the way that you know will have the maximum impact. In my case, you can do it because you want to get a girl's emotions going, make her cry, flex in front of her friends, whatever. But that's the point. And I think that if you take nothing else from this podcast or Red Pill in general, it's that you got to be more deliberate in your actions. Most guys are just kind of like humming and hawing through things, letting life happen to them. And they're thinking, what should I do? Not thinking it through. If more guys were to actually be deliberate, okay, what am I trying to achieve by doing this? Like, what's the purpose of me buying flowers? What am I doing here? And if you could answer that question and you can answer it honestly, you'll find just about any rule out there when it comes to dating, you can break. And you can break and do far better than a guy who's following the rules. Yeah, Tucker again. Giving gifts is like saying I love you too much. Uh... JD, I see you here. Did you have your dogs before or after she moved in? We got them after. Uh, she had a black lab when we were dating. But when she moved in, I had her mom take the black lab. because so I'm like, I don't have room for a big dog in my place. I'm not taking it. So that one did. We moved from the West Coast to Montreal. And she wanted to get a dog. So I'm like, all right eventually she kind of whittled me down. This is back when I was still blue pilled. And so essentially she put on the waterworks and I buckled down, get a dog. That was Chomsky. Awesome dog. I kind of got to like him. And then what I had done is a couple months later, I'm like, you know what? If we each have a dog, that would be cool. So I'm like, all right, two dogs, that's it. And the SPCA apparently had a puppy mill. They just, confiscated like 150 Italian greyhounds by this breeder who was doing all kinds of shady stuff. And so we put ourselves on a waiting list. Like if it happens, it happens. But then the breeder of a different breeder who she had talked to before said, Hey, this family just picked up an Italian greyhound. It's been two weeks and they don't want them anymore. And they're trying to get rid of them. So do you want them? And so we had like $800 worth of gear. And I think these dogs cost like a grand or something like something stupid like that giving us the whole thing for like 500 bucks. We're like, sure, why not? Funniest thing ever, by the way, that was Hitchens. Uh, we went to this house out in the suburbs in Montreal and these kids were so happy. They're like, look at our dog. He does this, he does this. And they're so happy and they're so proud. It was clearly a situation where the wife went out and bought the kids a dog without telling the husband and he shot that shit down. So, and they're like, yeah, he could do these tricks. This is the toys he likes. He's trained this. We love him so much. And then at the end of it, the dad kind of gives us the dog and like, all right, guys, you can take care. And then the look on the kids' faces when they realize that dad just sold their dog on them. <laughs> oh, those kids were bawling when we left. They were just howling, just laughing my ass off. <laughs> Stupid kids. And then like a week later, the SPCA called back saying that uh, they were putting the dogs up for adoption. And we ended up getting the third one. At that point, my dignity kicked in. I'm like, dude, this is it. Too many dogs. And so she's been trying to get a fourth dog since then. And I've been saying no ever since. But hey, you know what? We all don't start off as perfect. So that's my kind of like boo pill transition here. If I didn't learn to say no, I would have been one of those guys with Dr. Doolittle animals in the house. Logic behind bars, by the way, has a great term here that isn't well defined i've had a video on it a thousand foot tow rope if you guys don't know that's a married term because what happened is a guy would run dread and he would start getting into shape building frame passing tests styling dressing better learning game all this stuff 
And what would happen then is they had a covert contract. Well, if I do all these steps, my wife will love me. Doesn't work. And a lot of guys started to build up a lot of resentment going, I don't get it. I've been working out for six months. My wife hasn't even touched a weight. And she's eating chocolate. What's the, what's going on with this? And so a strategy that a lot of guys had is like, yeah, it's like a tow rope. This girl has seen you as a lazy piece of crap for God knows how often here. Here, one sec. That girl has seen you as a lazy piece of crap for like 10 years or however long the marriage was. And all of a sudden you lift a weight and two months later, she's supposed to start jumping on your, jumping on your dick and hitting the gym and stops eating. Like, no, it's not how it works. Like it takes some time for the other person to adjust to a new, you finish sabotaging your behaviors and then want to get on board. So we talk about the thousand foot tow rope and the 12 or the one month rule. And that's for every month, you've been a schlub in your relationship or for every year you've been a schlub in your relationship, assume it's one month to, to, to write things. And that's preventing people from maybe true, maybe not. It's never we pull out of our ass, but here's the point. It prevents guys. And here's another term from kicking the can down the road. This is one where a guy will, and you'll see this a lot of like red pilled content creators, yeah, I'd never let that girl do this to me. Ah, oh, you know, screw that bitch. I'm out of here. And they just leave. The problem is they don't acknowledge any fault that they had that created the situation of that loveless marriage they were in or that horrible relationship. And so when they get into the next one, they start making those same mistakes again. Uh, Carlos, I'll, let me put a thing on here. I don't want to forget this one, but uh, I'll get to that in a sec. But I mean, this is kind of the answer now. So that's the thing. And I am Steve McQueen was this uh, pseudonym. He was perfect about it. He, his wife was granted. His wife was horrible, but he ditched her right away. He's like, you know what? I'm done. Screw the dread game. I'm just going to do my own thing. Got a new girlfriend six weeks later. And then within a month, that girlfriend started acting the same way his crappy ex-wife was. And so he literally was making the same mistakes and getting the same outcome. The girls were molding themselves to his frame, which was an unattractive frame, and then acting unattractive because of it. So the purpose of the tow rope is to have a guy slow down and then understand the one month per year rule and be more meth methodical and deliberate about their map or mail action plan, running dread, all that stuff. And so usually when you put that, that break on it, two things will happen. One, the tow rope will pull tight. The girl starts, you know, oh, okay, so this is like serious. This isn't like a two-week thing. This is forever. I better get my butt in gear or I'm going to lose them to a better woman that's younger. Two, she is still crap. She doesn't want to change and he does leave her. But once he does leave, his life gets objectively better from that point on because he's dealt with all his personal demons. So how long... That was Carlos, Carlos's question. How long was my time transition from blue to red? Um, I know it was less than six months, but I was kind of, I don't want to say unique, but definitely uncommon in the sense that I flipped a switch, jumped in and you know what? I was perfectly happy to nuke my entire life. But at the time I was about to upend it anyway, I was on my way out of the military. There was a six month period where you have to wait for your release to be finished. And in that time, I essentially said, you know what, whatever. In six months, I'm going to be top of my game. Whoever's in my life is not valuable. They're gone. And it just so happened that everything worked out there. Um, it doesn't seem to be a very common thing, but I don't know. I guess it's the, the military can-do attitude in me. I'm just like, I'm not going to do this half ass. I'm going to do it all the way. Shout out to Logic Behind Bars, by the way. Thank you very much for the $5 super chat. You're the real MVP. We're going to leave that up. I wish you had a question. Oh, no, wait, you do. You do. It's up there. Uh, I meant more for myself at first, the whole fake it till you make it mindset, right? That's another one. Fake it till you make it. That's the pickup one. And that's a lot of, that was like the older version of the thousand foot tow rope, the, the month per year rules. It's the idea is that you can't be worried that you're, uh, 
that about imposter syndrome. You can't be worried that maybe you aren't as good as you're acting like you are, and you just have to believe in it while you're putting in the work to get up to it. <laughs> Again, thanks for the follow-up $2 logic behind bars. Uh, we're going to get through your thing here because I think it's a really, oops, a really good point. Uh, so the fake it till you make it mindset, there's a starting point. What metrics usually or time span does it take to become more internalized? Well, that depends on how invested you are in your current mental models. That depends on how willing you are to change and how much effort you put in. I've seen, and I won't mention who, but definitely content creators in this space who have been around as long as I have, who haven't shed some of the core fundamental Thing. So yeah, to get to your question, the fake it till you make it, but when does it become make it? And I can't give you a solid answer because if you're a fake it till you make it, if you're like, I'm working out, I'm going to start acting like I'm that super fit guy, but you kind of do fuck around itis in the gym and you don't actually lift very much, then yeah, that fake it is going to be a huge gap. But if you're that guy who, I mean, let's say you're on TRT, hit the gym five days a week, you just go hard and you exclude everything else from your life except for that. For you, it could be like six months until you're an intermediate lifter in phenomenal shape. Um, so yeah, you know you'll made it when you don't have to, when it becomes instinctual, I guess. Jeez, I can't even keep up. Fake it till you make it. More interested given that one first puts in the work. Yeah, it's surprising how fast it happens. I have seen six months as kind of the the make or break point when you could find a guy who fakes it till he makes it two feet in hundred percent invested. And it usually takes two years for a guy who's not, I'm not sure exactly why. How's it going Zen? Hey, one man's way. Two years is the, is for the guy who's full of covert contracts and never fully took the pill, I guess, for lack of a better word. I'm not sure why that is. I have a feeling it's the same reason that guys say that you shouldn't uh, get into a serious relationship with a girl for at least a year. Like don't promote her from a plate until 12 months in. Because when you have your own narcissistic fantasies, it usually takes one to two years for you to shed them. And for a lot of guys, they do the same thing. They're like, all right, I was doing dread and I've been doing it for two years. By the way, my wife's acting like this and I don't understand things. And I don't know why it's two years. I just know there's been like a dozen field reports of guys who did their dread game. They did their maps. They never really swapped notes with other guys. So they never got that feedback ne mechanism to keep them going. But at the two-year mark is when the fantasy gets crushed. So that's for guys who aren't who are putting in the work, but they're not self-aware enough to be aware of it. On the flip side... The guys who are completely self-aware of their failings, and I'll use a shout out to uh, Bogey D6 and X Attic Bro, some of my favorite guys. They've been around at least as long as me. Six months, completely turned their ships around. Oh my God, I did not know. Why was I not acting like this before? What is wrong with me? And the way to tell the difference is, is holding frame something you just do, or is it uh, who you are? That's the best way to tell the difference because most guys say I can't hold frame and I don't want to dance through hoops in this marriage and blah 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 because they're uh <sighs> because uh they're having to devote like decision making power and brain power to it and it's not sustainable. The guys who know what they're doing have internalized it and they just that's just how I act now because that's who I am. Rolo says it's because I am the game. That's what I'm talking about. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, we'll follow up here. He says he puts it in his own personal experience. Oh, and see, yeah, very beta, virgin until 23. He's 28 now and tons of lays. Enough to know, but not enough to know all. But I've reverted more in the mental progression as, and I don't know what he's going to follow up with. But yeah, that's the thing. Single guys, you kind of have to go through the process where, and we all do it. I mean, you eventually get your get your first notch, which is awesome. Your first girl you slept with. For most guys, it's always a couple of years later. I think Carl puts it five to seven years. Girls are sleeping with guys from about 15 to 16 years old on. Guys usually take a couple more years to get up there. Oh, actually here, we're going to follow up on this because this one's more interesting here. So 
He's going to put it from his personal experience. Very... Uh, if you really want to use Beta as an archetype like that, by the way, you should say Omega because Beta guys are like the best friend of the most attractive guy at the party. If you're saying unattractive, you could say Omega, but it doesn't really matter. I get what you're saying. Virgin till 23, 28 now, tons of lays, but reverted in his mental progression. So for examples, standing up for himself at one point became anger issues, lots of fights. So it's not fear, but I could see myself caring too much about other people's opinions where it wouldn't have before. Yeah, so this is an ego investment thing. It's fascinating that you bring it up, by the way. Something very common to guys who like red pill and they start becoming proselytizers. You treat it as a covert contract. Like I did all this red pill stuff. I build my frame. I got my notch counts. And you assume that other people owe you an attaboy or uh, adulation. And it makes sense because you're you're doing things. You're taking a lot of risks. You're building yourself up. There's a lot of work into it. All right, one man's way I see this, but I'm going to finish this question off and then get right to yours. Uh, so you put a lot of work in and you take some pride in your own self-improvement and self-actualization, which you should because you're doing stuff. The second phase of it is where you realize that nobody else cares and you're cool with that. And that's the part I think you were talking about struggling with. Convincing yourself you're worth the person you feel you are. Yeah, you just have to assume you are. But this anger comes because other people aren't adopting. And this is, again, narcissism is essentially building up your own fantasy. In your case, I did this work. I grabbed these notches. You people better think that I'm the top dog in this thing. I'm the alpha male, whatever. People don't think like that. People don't act like that. Uh, so you realize that, yeah, I'm not shit. And that's okay. And this is where your anger will start to go away because people not reacting as if you're the guy with, you know, 20 notches, 30 notches, 40 notches, whatever. And they don't think you're King Dingling doesn't phase you anymore because you're more confident in the skills that you've built up, but you're less in need of validation from others. And I think that's the lesson you can talk about in there that matters the most to you. When you get angry at somebody like this for not engaging in the, the framing of your own life, you stop seeking their validation. And then once you stop needing their validation, how they react doesn't phase you and your anger will shed and it will go away. Now, as far as a, a, a timeline for that, it's really is personal to everybody based on their own mentality and how willing they are to be past the anger phase. So just be aware once you stop caring what others think. And I don't mean that in like, a, Oh, I don't care what she thinks. I mean like truly just not caring. It'll be a bit more cynical and jaded than you think you should be, but it's really the only way to go about it. Uh, on that one, though, we're going to go one man's way. Thanks again. $20 super chat. Dude, I got low T 200 total and my psychiatrist, is that psychiatrist, said most combat veterans get low T from SSRIs and can't <laughs> finish. No wonder the suicide rate is so high. Yeah. Uh, dude, don't get me started. The military hands out SSRIs like candy, and apparently they hand it out to everybody like candy. Uh, if you guys don't know that SSRI is serotonin reduced inhibitor. What's the damn acronym for? I always get this wrong. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It's a type of antidepressant. It's funny because it's not that it's an antidepressant. It just, it blocks the hormone serotonin, which again, that provides the result. So if you guys don't know, let me get a proper definition because I always screw it up. Serotonin. It's a chemical that the nerves produce. It sends signals between your nerve cells. It's a contributor to feelings of well-being and happiness. <coughs> so the, the purpose of an inhibitor is to inhibit the reuptake of serotonin, which causes depression. Problem is, just like One Man's Way is talking about here, um, sexually, it really does numb sexual pleasure. Like, if you want to have to beat it like it owes you money, SSRIs will do that. I, I did not know it had effects on testosterone levels, but I would not be surprised because 
my last year in the military, they had me on SSRIs for a couple months and I just had like weight gain. It was just horrible. Yeah. Honestly, if you had to take SSRIs based on your doctor's recommendation, one sec here. If you had to take SSRIs, oh. excuse me. If you had to take them, realize it's a stopgap measure and you would need to have something like I know cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT is really good recommendations or, uh, but it has to have a timeline attached to it. Just know that this is while I deal with anxiety, get my therapy in place, get off of it the instant you can. Cause you realize there is a lot of physical and emotional issues that come with it. And the guys that are taking it as a coping strategy, it's absolutely horrible. And I couldn't say a lot less about it. Knowing that it drops your testosterone makes it even worse. But uh, next to that one, we got Divining Rod. Again, $5 Super Chat. Thank you very much. What is your personal workout routine? So my routine, it's pretty straightforward. I've been talking to Drew Bay, and he actually hooked me up with a great one. I have a bit of a unique situation. So in 2000, I think 14, Montreal, I got hit by a car while I was riding my bike to work. And I almost lost two fingers. They managed to put everything on me back together. The hand's still, for the most part, back to normal. But I actually have arthritis now in my hand from it. And my lifting has never been the same because I just don't have the grip strength. So I constantly had to wear hooks to do any lifting. Uh, injuries were happening more often. My musculature was like compensating too much. and My mobility took a hit. So what I do now is like a 60 second time under tension or like slow repetitions. And Drew could speak to this better than I do for the reason of it. But for me, I just know that I can lift without hooks and without pain, which is nice. My program is a very simple two day split type thing where uh, push days and pull days. I keep it in the compound lifts, squats, which I've switched over now because of my SI issues with my back. And that's from my military time. Hit 24 years old, back issues. How did that happen? But so I've switched over from rear squats to goblet squats. Um, then for the back, I just have bent over rows, shoulder presses, standing or seated, depending on the day, uh, planks for the abs, a, bent, a slight incline bench press. Like I said, the very standard compound lifts. I don't do much isolation work at all. I think I do biceps and triceps for isolations, and that's it. Beyond that, it's just 60 seconds time under tension per per set. And if it's a good day, five sets per exercise. If it's a really good day, eight sets. If it's that day that I'm just fighting, it's three. Uh, I do intermittent fasting two days a week because, oh, excuse me. I find that is an easier way to maintain a caloric deficit or, you know, keep my calories in check. On the days that I'm fasting, I tend to ease on the side of three sets versus that. But but yeah, it's really not very fancy, I find. And as much as I would love to say, oh, if I have a perfectly dialed in expert program, blah, blah, blah. Most guys, the issue is not your workout programs unoptim suboptimal. The problem is your consistency sucks. And so I'm focused more on going as often as I need to go more so than have I optimized this program. Because, I mean, essentially doing everything, hitting all your muscles, you're going to do a good enough job. If I'm on a day where I want to become, like, Instagram hot and Instagram ready, I'll worry about that. But, yeah, I mean, Strong List 5x5, five five, there's a reason it's the recommended program for most guys. You started out in the red pill because it's the hardest program to screw up. It's so standard. It's so easy, and all you have to do is literally follow the checklist. Uh, getting caught up now in the Super Chats. Kong, thank you for the $5. You know you're on track to giving less Fs when life and the world gets a little bit funnier. Yeah, I would agree. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that used to get you angry, if it doesn't make you laugh, then you really haven't built the frame. Uh, I'm going to jump back now to logic behind bars on his. It's true. Validation part somewhat. 
That was his first question about validation seeking. I started feeling pride on who I was. And as you said, nobody cared. Little by little, I started drifting and even improve me if that makes sense. Yeah, see, that's the, for the most part, it's validation. And once you said that, like you're the internal metric of your own validation. I lift weights because I want to look attractive. And I know it sounds corny to say I'm doing it for me, but that's just a way for you to articulate in your head that I have outcome independence. If somebody else doesn't comment on how swole I am or how jacked I am or how yoked I am, that's fine because I look in the mirror. I know my metrics. I know how big I am and how big I need to be, et cetera, et cetera. So you're doing it for you, but at the same time, you're self-aware of being more physically attractive. <laughs> Being more physically attractive has benefits to it. It's just a realistic assessment. BJ Tucker with the $5 super chat and the cheeky comment. Get that COVID-19 checked out, brah. <laughs> Son of a bitch. By the way, is that not absolutely hilarious? World Health Organization. I didn't know that the uh, it was them and somebody else have been offering help for China for like the last couple months. And China has denied them all. The thing is like spiraling out of control because of like lackluster bureaucratic nonsense. And so what does the WHO do? Instead of dealing with it, they rename coronavirus to COVID-19 because that doesn't bring any shade. Like it helps the Chinese save face, I guess is the thing. It's not racist to say COVID-19. I'm like, that's peak SJW. When you rename a virus because you're worried that it might make people feel like bigotry against a certain culture. Like, whatever. Yeah, Divining Rod. I should probably, if I get a chance, I will pull up the photos. I don't know why, but. <laughs> All right. You know what? We're coming. I'm going to probably end this in the next, like, 15 minutes or so. But I'll tell you a story. The story about how I got hit by a car. Um, spikling, biking to work. I don't remember any of it. I just woke up getting ready to go to work. And I was stapled to, I was, like, strapped down to a wooden board I'm like what the hell <laughs> um i'm gonna leave this up just because it's funny and whatever he paid for the joke let him have it <laughs> uh so i got hit by a car they filled me in there here's the weird thing typical military guy my first thought is i'm gonna be late for work my phone for some reason was still in my pocket not smashed so pick up my phone i call work I call my boss i'm like yeah i don't think i can come in today because i i I'm strapped to a thing in the hospital and they're attaching my hand to me. And he goes, Oh, okay. I call my girl and she's freaking out. I guess she was halfway to work and she had to drive home. I'm like, yeah, hit me so hard that I told them I was from the hospital. I was, I was at the hospital. I got born in, I was born in Edmonton, Alberta. So I told her, yeah, I'm at Edmonton general hospital. It doesn't even exist anymore, but uh, it's hilarious. Cause she's like, we live in Montreal. What the hell? <laughs> so they knocked me back to my childhood. Anyways, I guess when she got there, uh, they were like reattaching my finger, like pushing it in and squeezing it on. And she was like completely disgusted by it. I took some pictures of the x-rays, which is absolutely hilarious. They shoved a pin in there. I had like a four inch pin in my hand for the longest time. Montreal being a no fault insurance place. Well, it's, your, it's not your fault. It's not his fault. So I didn't get paid or anything. It was just literally like, yeah, come to the hospital. We'll fix you up and send you on your way. So that was the funny thing. Yeah, the technical designation for it. But that's the thing. Like COVID-19, it is the technical designation for it. But they kind of had to change that recently. And that was the justification that they used. So but whatever. I don't really care. <laughs> Dude, I'm eating. <laughs> yeah. But I'll get some photos and I'll throw those on Twitter because I always like showing those off. Like, yeah, there was my hand. There's, there's your hand before Montreal. and There's your hand after Montreal. Deployed, man. Sailed around the world, went through the Straits of Hormuz probably seven times. Iran was putting missile locks onto our ship. I survived all kinds, not a scratch on me, not a scratch. Up and down the Somali coast, nothing. One month in the Bell province and uh, I almost get killed. <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, that's always something I laugh about. I guess there's the example for frame, by the way. If you can... Uh, if you can laugh about that time you almost got killed, <laughs> then I guess you just really don't, you know, are too worried about validation anymore. <laughs> uh, all right. So we're running on the half hour right now. I'm probably going to close this down in the next five minutes. Let's do freeform. 
What do you guys want to talk about? Ooh. The other question was ego versus pride. And can both be... This is logic behind bars, by the way. Thanks again for the follow-up super chat. I wish you typed this all out the first time because now I get to wait and fill the air until you finish typing the second part of your question. <laughs> but yeah, ego versus pride. Uh, ego, it's not... It's good and it's bad. Pride is just interchangeably used here. I think I know where your question is going, so I'll I'll answer it as best I can and I'll change it as you get your second half of the super chat in. But so ego is our narcissistic investment. Guys are narcissistic. That's the male psychological manifestation. Ego is what makes us guys in the same way that like narcissism dialed down to eight from a 10 is healthy male versus unhealthy male. Borderlines, the female equivalent, but we'll get into that here. So we talk about pride, and I put it into an article I wrote about uh, authenticity. It's on my blog. Go ahead, check it out if you want to. Ah, so this is perfect. Yeah, we're on the same thing here. So you said to shed the ego, but aren't there times that ego and pride are needed for personal sense of worth? <coughs> Absolutely it is. And here's the point I'm going to make to you. It's the... Uh, The point of ego is to have that narcissism, the attractive quality from the dark triad standpoint. The bad point of it is when it starts, you're basically delusional. The point I made was, if you guys remember the movie Mad Men, there's John Hamm, who played a character who was called Walt Whitman, who was pretending to be somebody named Don Draper. If you want to think about unhealthy narcissism, think about wanting to be Don Draper. That was Walt Whitman. Most guys who think they're like, and I'll use the alpha male as the example here. I'm Don Draper. I'm cool. I'm suave. I sleep with all the girls. They're being Walt Whitman there. And that's where the bad part of ego comes in. Because if you noticed on that show, every time that uh, somebody referred to him as Walt Whitman, or they knew about his past and that he would break into, like he'd become a blubbering child, broke down, horrible. And that's not authentic. The good side of ego is in that same situation, you're thinking of yourself as John Hamm. He's an actor. He's playing a role. His role is that of a narcissist at one point, a blubbering idiot the next point. And here's the difference. If somebody were to call out Don Draper as being a fraud and a fake and a phony, he would freak out, get mad, start crying, whatever. If somebody brings that up to John Hamm, he would look at you like you got three fucking heads. He's like, dude, I'm playing a part in a movie. Like, what are you? What's wrong with you? So the healthy and the healthy part of ego is where he knows he's the shit because he was written into that part as the shit. But if somebody smashes that narcissistic fantasy, you understand like it's a game. That's the point of game. It's supposed to be fun. You think you're the coolest alpha male that ever alpha. You're like, yeah, so whatever. You're just playing a part. You're entertaining. If you can how to have that detachment from your own ego, you can use it in healthy ways. And this is what gets to logic behind bars question here. Understand that your ego is not you. You can shed it in a moment if you need it. If you need it back, you can put it back there. You can act like a huge raging narcissist when it benefits you. You can be surprisingly humble when it benefits you. But you're treating it like a tool. You're treating it like tradecraft. You're not treating it like an identity. And that is the difference between ego and uh, healthy levels of narcissism. So I hope that answers your question sufficiently here. So... Shout out now to our future MD1. Thank you for the $10 super chat. I wish you had something behind it. I always love talking with you guys. Matt, I'll see you on the rule zero. But yeah, future MD, really appreciate it. Cheers. <laughs> I'm going to do a quick little follow-up on the last bits of the chat here after him. And then we're going to take off. I'm going to take a bit of a break, and then we'll head down to rule zero. So. Um, right way to respond to weak flexes dude won't take a hint he's a bit short to see me uh you guys are having like a side conversation i want to interrupt that you guys are doing fine you don't need me talking about this uh jd here what's the name of your third dog so the three dogs in order of when we got them was chomsky he's the half-faced dog with the scars on his lips hitchens the big one the big brown one and then the gray one is sagan that's my three dogs 
Uh, BJ Tucker here. His question, would you or the panel be interested in chatting with guys in a successful marriage of 10 to 20 years? I'm busting at the seams with all the Spurgs giving <laughs> middles to marriage. Yeah, dude, Tucker, we already do that. How long do you think Rule Zero Dad's been married for? Uh, Why More Please has been married for like a decade. I've been in my common law marriage for like 11 years. I have a lot of guys on who have been married for like long lengths of time. Rolo is 23 years. Like we do. Here's the thing. The guys who have had long-term successful marriages don't talk about their marriage as much because it's just like background noise. It's the guys who are two years into a marriage keep talking about how to be the best alpha that ever married an alpha. So if you're talking to a guy who seems to have his act together and is a little bit older and doesn't talk about marriage, then he probably has a good marriage. It's the guys who keep blathering on about it are the ones that are really insecure about that. Like the Pat Stedman types. It's like, hey, this is the way you keep a girl. Just buy her more flowers. Like, whatever. Um, and I guess we'll end off on this one here from Adrian. So are you saying that some people cannot shed their narcissistic because they are not aware of their ego? Ah, oh, damn it, Dan. All right, I'm going to do Dan's after. Yeah. They are aware. It's a subconscious thing, though. It's... It's hard to explain, but yeah, there's a self-awareness fact that's missing here. But Dan Avita, thank you very much. The $20 super chat. You're going to be what's closing this out here. On a show with Rolo, you talked about ghosting women who lost respect. Great knowledge. Thanks, girl, what you do. Yeah, no worries, homie. Yeah, if she loses respect, it's pretty much over. It's You can win it back, but that's like a Rule 7 thing. <laughs> you guys, fucking weirdos. Um, so we're going to end on there. Thanks, guys, for sticking around. We'll see you in about 40 minutes. Uh, Rich's channel, Rule Zero. Special announcement. It's going to be pretty fun. And then I guess just quickly here, Butte Ween, my favorite coffee. I'm not too fussy. I just like coffee that's better than trashed here coffee. If it's not no-name brand, it tend to be good. I find the way you brew it matters more than the quality of the beans. So, But on that note, I'll catch you guys in the next one. Cheers.